Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to the AFI Docs 2021 Industry Forum and to this session, Philly DA, the making of the landmark new Independent Lens docu-series, Part 2. First, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I also want to thank our AFI members and you, our audience. I also want to thank our moderator, all of our panelists, and our ASL interpreters. For those of you who have uh, not yet seen Philly DA, uh, I urge you at your earliest convenience to check out all eight episodes streaming now on the PBS video app and pbs.org. Please note that if you have questions for our panelists, please include those in the chat and we will feed those to the moder moderator for our Q&A at the end. Now, by way of introductions, Sherry Simpson will be moderating today's conversation. Sherry is Senior Director Engagement and Impact Innovation at ITVS. Our panelists are Javi De Bruin, Impact Producer on Philly DA, Michael Gottwald, Producer on Philly DA. His company is the Department of Motion Pictures. We also have Emily Hackshaw, Director of Community Engagement at Georgia Public Television. Travis Mitchell, Senior Vice President and Chief Content Officer at our neighbor station, Maryland Public Television, um, and Latanya Myers, Founder Above All Odds, who's also a participant in Philly DA's episode four. Um, I also wanna welcome our interpreters, Jill and Shannon. And now it's my time to turn it over to the fabulous Sherry Simpson. Sherry, take it away. Hi, Ken. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Ken, and welcome all of you to really um, a continuation of the previous conversation. And many of you um, were probably in that discussion as well on Philly DA, the landmark series. And we're continuing to look now at the role of engagement and impact in this eight part series. And I wanna just start by um, recalling for all of us um, just the framing for the show itself. Um, Larry Krasner, um, when he mounted a long shot campaign to become district attorney of Philadelphia and won, he pledged to end mass incarceration by changing the culture of the criminal justice system from within. So over eight episodes, um, we have had and we still have the opportunity to go behind the scenes with Larry Krasner in what he considers a new civil rights movement. What makes this series so stand out is not only this exploration of his office and the unprecedented access, but it's also the look that we get into the day-to-day -day lives of people in Philadelphia and the impact of the criminal justice system on their lives and how it all is interwoven. So aside from learning more about the role of the prosecutor, which is the key impact goal um, that we'll hear much more about, um, we at ITVS participated in really for what was for us a landmark campaign as well. And that is really answering this question, how do you carry out engagement and impact for an eight part docu-series? Um, docu-series are still somewhat new to most of us, but the reality is that there's eight episodes and the opportunity to do widespread engagement. Um, over the course of the series thus far, and engagement is still continuing, um, we have had uh, well over 50 markets participate in screenings and deep dive conversations around the criminal justice system. Um, we've been working with our stations through the Indie Lens pop-up program, and over 70 screenings have been held to date in cities across America. Um, to that end, we continue that work, and today we'll be meeting with not only stations that have participated, but the filmmaking team, the impact producer who's been leading this work, and really, um, we're just continuing the conversation that we were having earlier. I think it was um, Yoni Brooks who made this incredible statement um, asking the quintessential question that we bring to this panel, and that is, what is the power of storytelling to make change? Um, for that uh, role, we're going to now really open it up to everyone. I'm going to ask everyone if you would uh, take your cameras off and join me here. And oh, excuse me, actually, before we do that, hang on one moment, we're going to actually go to a clip of Philly DA to set the tone. And then when we return, we'll introduce our panel. Thank you so much. And to the clip.
Larry Krasner, he's just a danger to the city. Well, that's nonsense. You're being lied to. This is what democracy looks like. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. Welcome to our panel. And um, we're gonna dive right in and everyone can take their cameras off. And um, welcome, welcoming to the virtual stage, uh, Michael Gottwald, Javi De Bruin. We have with us Travis Mitchell, Latanya Myers, Emily Hackshaw and myself, Sherry Simpson. Michael, we're gonna really start um, with you um, as a filmmaker and producer. Um, and actually I'm gonna start, we're gonna ease into our conversation about engagement, but I'm, I'm curious. I, I think it may have been Ron Howard and I welcome our audience to correct me if I'm wrong. So please feel free to start chatting and we'll be getting your questions later. But I think it was Ron Howard who made this point that all producers, all film producers are always kind of getting at one particular story. It can be an underdog story. It can be um, a story, you know, the hero's journey. And I'm just curious, from a filmmaking standpoint, there's some deep motivation, I'm sure, for your involvement with Philly DA. Can you share with us the inspiration for really looking more closely at this role of prosecutor? And I think even to more the point, um, the people of this country and how mass incarceration is really impacting people. Sure. Thank you, Sherry. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'll speak to what drew uh, myself in, as well as um, fellow producers. And I think that that, that was essentially, I saw, um, they had already been filming with Larry for quite a bit, probably about six months. And I saw a clip that is the first scene that you see in the show, if you watch the show. It's them at the um, meeting. Uh, uh, it's Larry and his, and his team. And they just dive straight into policy reform immediately off the bat, and it's um, pretty jarring how re how radical it, it is. And you see them making change in real time. And the second I saw that, I said, "This is something that we've never really seen before." The whole idea of a uh, of a DA is that they have immense amount of discretionary or discretion, and as a result, there's just this kind of like black box that nobody gets let into about how they kind of. Um, determine uh, their kind of the regulations, the mandates, et cetera. And so that the, to be thrust into that black box immediately and see what's going on in there, I said, this is unlike anything we've we've ever seen. And so is does that relate to a larger story that is one of the kind of big stories that we are always telling as as human beings? I guess so. Yeah, I guess it's one that's like um, secrets exposed or or just transparency or, you know, there's the embedded kind of um, underdog thing or kind of the person who speaks uh, truth in a room that doesn't really want to hear it. And I think that's that Larry and the team and his team kind of are about all of that all at once. And I just knew we had to be involved. And I knew that it was the perfect match of like what filmmaking can put you in places that you don't otherwise get to go. And by being able to get there, and go there, you are actually changing the conversation too. So it's the perfect marriage of, of um, storytelling with um, making change because once you see what's actually going on behind closed doors, you, you are better informed and you can sort of know how to kind of leverage your political agency. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. And just a, a quick follow up question. And as we set the table here for this discussion, um, prosecutors have won elections traditionally, right, going back in time by championing this sort of um, hard on crime um, stance. And quite often, um, even the number of convictions um, had been a measure of success. And what we saw in Philly DA is that that was certainly the case. And so going back to, um, to Yoni, the second part of the comment that Yoni Brooks, uh, one of our directors for Philly DA made in the previous panel was this idea that, yeah, you know, there is power to storytelling and at the same time, um, one of the biggest obstacles to that is shifting entrenched narratives or entrenched thinking. And I want to throw this to you, Michael, but I'm going to open it up to everyone, really. Um, this whole idea of, you know, does 
film really have the power to move these entrenched narratives and entrenched thinking? And did you see any of that in the making of Philly DA or during this engagement period? Have you seen the power of storytelling actually shifting? Sure, I can kick it off, but yeah, I would be as, as curious to hear from, from others on the panel too. I mean, I think that certainly um, by seeing things that you don't, all, that you don't um, usually see, uh, you know, just, just I mean, with the, the whole thing, the whole reason that Larry said that we were, that gave us the okay to film with him is that he wanted it to be a document of transparency. He said, no matter what happens to me, win, lose, you know, pass, fail, succeed, or just burn to the ground, like there should be a record of this and what went wrong or what went right. And so I think that other progressive district attorneys will be able to learn from um, watching the show for sure, what mistakes to make or what mistakes not to make, how to, um, you know, I'm thinking especially of like episode six, where you really see Larry um, fail to communicate properly to some of the people in his uh, in, in a particular neighborhood in Philadelphia, um, you know, just keeps hitting the, the the facts and the science and he's not really speaking to what people are feeling. Um, and I think Larry would be the first to say that that was a uh, not a great performance by him. And I think that's a perfect example of somebody who watches that and says, okay, I know that I need to meet people where they are and not just come in and um, just be so matter of fact about this stuff all the time. Um, so in real time, what we have seen, um, I think we've had an immense response to the show generally. I think we've had people who have reconsidered, come, come to us and reconsidered careers and what side of things they want to be on. Um, they didn't think that they could make change on the, on the um, prosecutorial side, you know, um, people who are defense attorneys who are now thinking about going the other way. And that actually leads pretty directly into some of what we're trying to do in terms of getting the the series in front of law students and that was always kind of a priority to us um and it was a priority to larry too but we uh from a different perspective we just wanted we thought like what better audience to i mean i don't want to say they're the best audience because, because i think obviously there's a lot of people who can be affected by this but in terms of people who can actually make a change to their career paths um, based on what they see in the show, I think that was an obvious one. Um, and so Javi has been working on some of that. Um, but yeah, that, that's just an example. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And I think it to as well, this idea that even as you're making the film, you're engaged in the potential for change as you identify folks and the audiences and the, you know, places where change is possible. So I want to definitely get to everybody on that whole question of the power of storytelling and change. But I want to toss it to Javi. It's a perfect segue to um, introduce again, Javi De Bruin, who is actually the impact producer uh, for the Philly DA series. And Javi, I want to just start with Michael's throw to you as well. What was your role in coming on? I mean, this is huge, just to frame it again. There is an entire progressive prosecutor movement happening in this country started Afri actually by African-American women who had been working and carrying this drumbeat forward. Larry is aligned with that movement. How in the world do you as an impact producer harness the power of storytelling to make this kind of change? Over to you, Javi. Yeah, um, so I, I think that the two key words are convening and connection. Um, when it comes to impact producing, um, you know, sort of what, what Michael said about filmmaking, being able to give people an, a sense of access they don't normally have. I think that uh, in a lot of ways, the job of an impact producer is to continue providing that access by bringing people together who might not normally be in conversation with one another by having or by having conversations like within our communities about things we might not normally gather to talk about so frankly. Um, I think that that is the power that this kind of storytelling gives us. It charges us up, it gets us excited and it, and it you know, touches us in personal ways. Um, you know, I think that you see something that you relate to or that you didn't know about. Um, and there's a lot of potential in the emotional grip of a uh, series like Philly DA. Um, and one of the things that I loved so much um, that attracted me to this series is the way that it really is, the, the bigger picture really is about communities within Philadelphia. And, you know, the, the DA's office and Larry become an entry point for us to really better understand how 
communities in Philadelphia are interacting with and grappling with, with the criminal legal system. Um, and so in coming on, I think a lot of my role is to listen to all of the different stakeholders here um, and to look for moments of alignment, look for places where we can have these conversations, um, you know, even among folks who might seem like there's, there's contention there, I think actually that's where there's often a lot of really great room for discussion. Um, and so I, in that vein, started uh, my work with the series um, by convening what we call as impact producers a brain trust, which is basically just a big strategy brainstorming meeting. Um, and we gathered some folks, uh, we gathered folks involved with the film, we gathered um, uh, NGOs together, we gathered community activists, we gathered people who are in the policy realm um, to talk about what they had been able to watch in the series, to talk about you know, what are the most pressing issues that you saw here that are facing your community right now and how can we leverage this as a tool to support the work you're doing? So a lot of it really is that, that connecting, um, bringing folks together and trying to see where there's room for collaboration. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Javi. And let me say, um, you know, Javi's passion and, you know, strategy um, has been appreciated by ITBS in the past. And I know one question we get a lot is from filmmakers is, you know, do you work with impact producers or how does this all come together? As I mentioned, we have an IL pop-up program. We have a new town hall in the box program, which we're gonna get to later in this conversation. Um, and the answer being the more is more is needed, <laughs> that this work um, really pays off in the long tail. And so if we're looking at short, medium and long-term strategy, the strategy continues. And I would say, um, Javi, we want to come back to you in a little bit to hear a little bit more about how those brain trusts and NGOs pay off for sustainable campaigns. Um, because so often it is about the push to broadcast or the work of um, maintaining a particular group or one conversation, but this is really a strategy on a number of levels that you've been commandeering. Um, I'm gonna just open it up um, now to that powerful question um, around storytelling and bring in Latanya Myers, um, who is with us. Um, some of you who are familiar with Philly DA will recognize Latanya. Um, and in addition to being a part of the Philly DA series. Um, I know that she has been uh, really doing extraordinary activism. And um, Latanya, let me go to you now um, to just ask a question about just how you really became involved with Philly DA. How, how, how did the producers find you? And obviously it's a story that, um, you know, it's a story of trust as well, because this is your life. And we'd like to hear a little bit about you and how you came to be affiliated with Philly DA. Ms. Sherry, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for the PBS members, Independent Lens, Highway, for making sure, like you said, that this is not you know, a performative act, but this is also a call to action from individuals within our community to understand that they can be a part of this conversation and push the narrative forward. Um, I wanna say like, thank you to Ted, Yoni and Nicole in particular that like really caught me at a, vul uh, a revolutionary vulnerable state that like something was simmering that I couldn't make a connection to, but they seen the bigger picture, right? And the bigger picture was getting it to people to understand that civic engagement is the bigger picture for pushing forward what we need to happen in our country for us democracy. Um, so I really appreciate them for that. And actually what happened was um, months prior to my release, as I was held on cash bail, I couldn't afford it. Um, I had a current DA that was being indicted on charges. And then all of a sudden, people are asking us for our votes within jail. And I never even knew that we voted our DA in, nor that we voted our judges in. So coming home and writing letters and connecting with uh, the Philadelphia um, Community College and learned that they had a re-entry program specifically for individuals. So I wanted to know how can I could have been civically engaged and going through that program, they was like, you're an activist. And I'm like, what's an activist, right? And they was like, no, you understand the two that can push policy, right? 
and they invited me to join a fellowship, which was with the People's Paper Co-op, which would uplift the voices of impacted individuals um, for what is now an annual uh, Women's in Reentry Day, where the Philadelphia Community Bell Fund posted bell for individuals that couldn't afford their freedom. And this was striking to me because I said, we've been through that part of our history, right? Like, are we still having to purchase the freedom of the people that we love when they're innocent? Um, so in, in that, um, I, I got connected with Miss Yvette uh, Latley, who was doing the NPR series at the time, who connected me with Isaac Skoloff, who said, hey, I can't get you in this current documentary that I am, but the passion and the vision that, that filmmakers have and can see on the ground in a way that can, can like catapult our voices in the mainstream to understand that we have a connection and that we understand what needs to be put. So that what got me in front of Nicole and Ted. And for the last like two and a half years, literally, I was just like, well, I'm going to speak at this event on Cash Bell. And if y'all want to join, let's go. And just organically, at that event, I was offered a position as the first bell navigator in the state of Pennsylvania when asked the question, what do we need to bring change in, for and in, 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 in the judiciary system um, for us, Pennsylvania? And I said, it's compassion. If you watch the fourth episode of Philly DA, you'll see my exact questions. I mean, answers to that question. And that resulted in to someone seeing who I was as an individual and an intricate tool of advocacy to push forth and dispel the narrative that individual has before us. So that cultivated me into like founding the organization of Above All Odds. And I just appreciate really um, Jave, um really connecting that situation and, you know, all that we would have a opportunity to show individuals and particularly LGBTQ individuals that people that look like us that are fighting for us and that we can make change if we stand together in civic engagement. So I just really say thank you so much for Independent Liz taking this story one step further and in, in, into a form of civic engagement and continuing to allow us to amplify our voices. Latanya, um we thank you. And I think that, you know, at this particular moment, um, you know, it's, it's not only for sharing your story. I mean, people talk about, well, you know, Larry Krasner allowed the cameras into his office and that is amazing. And through that, you know, we've gotten all, there's so much and we're gonna learn more about that as well. Um, and for you to open your life story to cameras and to, these are poignant mo moments, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen Philly Dia yet, or for those of you who have, I revisit moments with you all the time, Latanya, as a reminder in the work that we do, um, what is possible when people are willing and able to lift their voices and to be authentic and real about their situation. As you said, it's not performative, it's just, this is what's going on in this country. And it's a picture is worth a thousand words, but really this is the power of storytelling. Um, we're gonna come right back to you, Latanya, but before we do, I wanna share a clip from episode four and thank you for queuing that up. <laughs> um, let's go to the clip and, and Latanya, when we come back, I'd like to offer, ask you for a commentary on, uh, on this scene as well. Here we go, thank you. Panel number four includes Latonia Myers. Would you like to begin? Within the last 18 months, I was able to start school, start community college. I apologize, I'm a little nervous, but I was able to find my voice and become an advocate, to, to be a part of the solution and not the problem. I think when it comes to true probation reform, we have to start with the reform of the culture in the probation department. I mean, a culture in a probation department is not one that's encouraging. It's not empowerment. When I got on probation, all I was told was I have to come in here weekly and report. I was looked at as high risk because of an algorithm that no matter what I accomplished till 2027, it would never change. 
That is a meaningless, endless cycle, a cycle of trauma, a cycle of pain. And some of the effects can be irreversible. We just want to give a true, fair second chance, not a second class citizen, but a fair second chance to prove ourselves and to build our communities up. Thank you. Well, um, I think that speaks for itself in terms of um, the power of words and the power of the storytelling that we're exploring this panel um, to be in that moment with you. And there are many, many more in episode four. Latanya, I just want to um, give you the floor for a moment just to share with us and to, you know, just what is this, the meaning of cash bail for you? And what is the meaning of uh, probation and, you know, how your life um, just and how you see the power of this story being out there for people to understand this more um, and not just have it be um, terms and terminology and yeah so over to you Latanya. Thank you so much Miss Sherry just even watching that clip it was like almost I was transitioned in a moment from my ancestors like the words that was coming out of my mouth it wasn't from my brain it was from my heart and it was from my soul it was in nothing pre-scripted. I didn't, I haven't even been to Harrisburg prior to that, right? And I didn't even know that we had a committee oversight in these type of issues. So um, I just wanted to really speak truth to power and be authentic within myself. Um, I was nervous as I'm stated, and I wanted to step back and, and you know, acknowledge that, you know, um, hierarchy that's above our criminal justice system that, really doesn't tie to the uh, environment or what's, what's going on within a community. And um, just, just being there and being able to speak truth to power, but also understanding that this is just not it. You know, this is an opportunity for other individuals throughout the nation, throughout the world, throughout the globe and our earth to say that, hey, I have a voice and I can be civically engaged and I deserve a right to speak truth to the people that claim power over the decisions that's made that, you know, have effects on our lives. And seriously, you know, these, some of these effects are irreversible, unfortunately, and just not being, um, you know, versed to those type of climates. I was super nervous, but I just really feel as though that my ancestors took something over me that, spoke for me um, in a way where I hope that it speaks and it invokes inspiration to others throughout the nation to, to because of what is broadcasted, they can see that we are trying and that they're not alone. And even though individuals that's on the TV that don't look like us, that there are people that's fighting for us and that's amongst us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Latanya. And I want to I want to build on that notion because what I'm struck by being here, um, and really is just pivoting to, where in this, do we actually have the opportunity to have these conversations? So we, you know, really kudos to the incredible filmmakers who have made this possible, to you, Latanya, for being part of it, and then the the. It, would, it occurs to me that the real work are in moments like this, where we get to actually hear directly from people who are involved on the front lines of this mass incarceration and criminal justice system. So all of these elements work together in tandem, the film, the conversation. And I wanna point out another ingredient that we've been experiencing, certainly at ITVS, and that is safe environments for deeper dive conversations that allow for people to truly communicate on issues that let's face it, um, during the course of alone, we um, in the making of and in the presentation of it, we've had COVID, we've had um, the reckoning, um, the murder of George Floyd, and then the first year anniversary coinciding with episode seven. So just, we're not operating in a vacuum here around these conversations. So I wanna open this up um, to uh, Travis Mitchell um, of Maryland Public Television, and then uh, Emily Hatshaw of Georgia Public Broadcasting, who have been at the forefront um, nationally of hosting engagement events to 
not only share screenings of these films, but to have deeper dive conversations, really conversations for change. Um, so Travis, I see you're unmiked. I wanna unmute it rather. I'd like to go to you and I'm just gonna open it up to say, please share with us the importance of these dialogues and the environments that you've been creating at Maryland Public Television. Who's participating in these conversations and what's the value? So first and foremost, it all begins with the powerful filmmaking and creative talents of the storytellers. And you, you talked about uh, the importance of storytelling and can storytelling really affect change? And I think what it does is it amplifies our humanity. It amplifies our vulnerabilities, our fears, our highest hopes, our deepest dreams, and our faith. And because you have people courageous as Latanya. Uh, in the conversations that we had, it was Latanya's courage, her boldness, her authenticity that really enabled people to not lock in on policy issues or debates, but lock in on the human condition. And I think in public media, what we do best is when we, as stewards over the platform that belongs to all people, it when you have amplified voices and when you have people are willing to speak their truth where there may be policy differences positional differences what everyone can relate to is that humanity and that at the end of the day we all feel the same we all hurt we all cry we all suffer as a result of tragedy. So that is an important ingredient because it sets the stage for us to understand that positive dialogue, getting involved in your community, getting involved in making sure your voice can be heard. Latanya is an example of one person whose courage has led her to make change and impact her local community. So other people are able to draw inspiration from that. So when we have these, these conversations, in, in Maryland, for instance, we have had very similar situations, Freddie Gray, so forth and so on. In Prince George's County, Maryland, uh, there was uh, um, a real in-depth study of the cash bail system by Howard University School of Law. When we had LaTanya featured, Latanya was able to, through the lens of her own lived experience, explain the, the real tragedy of the cash bail system and how it needed to be reformed. She was the centerpiece in helping people understand that this is not something that just happens to those people. This is something that happens to everybody. And if you don't fix it, you create a system of inequity that really prevents communities from taking full advantage of the gifts, talents, and abilities of their citizenry. So Latanya was able to connect with a young man in, in Maryland, uh, Adam Jackson, who runs an organization called We the People, who had been locked in for nine years trying to effect change of laws in here, in here in Maryland around these very issues. And so that dialogue then helped it not be just a Baltimore issue. It helped it not just be a Philadelphia issue. It helped it become an American issue. And when LaTanya and Adam communicated, it gave us a glimpse of what possibilities existed. Now in Maryland Public Television, much like uh, PBS affiliates across the country, our demographic tends to be older and tends to not be as diverse as we would like for it to be. These conversations featuring these films, featuring um, heroes and sheroes like Latanya, who are engaged in the battle, enable people to understand that we cannot take for granted and stand back and watch what is happening. If we're gonna get engaged in making America a better place, we've gotta all roll up our sleeves and come to the table. And that's what we wanted to accomplish. Can we at least come to the table? Can we at least have a conversation? Can we at least engage in dialogue that we hope ends with positive action? So the other takeaway from this is, the, is that Latanya mentioned several times that Change is not microwavable. You, you can't watch a program and then share your piece and let it end there. You have got to do the heavy lifting that comes along with investing your sweat, 
investing your blood, investing your essence and making America a better place. This is what America is. And so we didn't arrive at this place without those types of sacrifices. And so Sherry, the final point I would make is opening up the platform to bring in voices to amplify the work, the principles in the film, bringing in, using the platform to make sure that every opinion, every voice matters and creating that space, that safe space for people to communicate. I think only can public media do that. Only can we have these discussions free of agendas, free of corporate influence, free of politics. And it is the place that I believe is the best place for these times for Americans to have these very difficult conversations, first to understand, second to amplify humanity, and third to make positive change because we reach a place of consensus. But without those who are courageous like Latanya, it's, it's not possible. Yeah. Well, thank you, Travis, for that. Um, you know, and we just applaud the work that Maryland Public Television has been doing in the system overall. And I think, you know, tying this back to our filmmakers, I know in our previous panel, you know, we heard from the filmmakers as well. And I know, you know, Michael, and you know, feel free to chime in at any time, but that public television, just in the sheer making of this series, you know, provided a space that in an, in effect was safe to be able to generate um, the work that the work at hand. And so very appreciative that that extends as well to stations who really have a unique role um, in the distribution of these films and the conversations. So I know for many, we th tend to think of our PBS station as the you know broadcaster, if you will. And it sounds like that role is changing or that role is really expanding. And um, let me actually on that note, move to Emily, uh, Emily Hackshaw, who's with us from Georgia, Georgia Public Broadcasting. And Emily, I know um, because we've worked so closely with you as well as Maryland Public Television in the IL pop-up program over a number of years. Again, that's our free screening series. Um, but I've noticed over time that you have really been generating some extraordinarily powerful programs as well. Um, often we envision these engagement events as preaching to the choir, but you've been bringing unique panels and conversations to the forefront um, and boldly bringing in um, folks who would not necessarily always be in a room together. Can you share a little bit about the work that you've been doing in Georgia with Philly DA? Sure, Thanks. yeah. Well, thank you so much um, to the filmmaking team, to Javi. I would just say that the work that the impact producers do that you talked about, it, it kind of paves the way for what we're able to do in our local communities and just kind of take it one step further and, and really localize it. And it's amazing. Um, and this series was fabulous, offered some really wonderful opportunities to do just what you said, Sherry, and bring people together who may not normally be seated around the table together. Um, I was really thrilled to host a conversation. Uh, we are a statewide network, and so we are serving all of Georgia, which of course includes Atlanta, Metro Atlanta, but also or, you know, rural South Georgia, coastal Georgia, mountains in the north. So um, we have a very uh, wide ranging um, audience. And so we were, we brought together a panel, um, a progressive district attorney from Georgia's Western Judicial Circuit in Northeast Georgia, who is part of Fair and Just Prosecution with Larry Krasner. Um, and we were able to pair with her a police chief from LaGrange, Georgia, which is a rural community um, west, close toward Alabama. And then the executive director of Atlanta Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative here in Atlanta, who have done extensive work um, to reform cash bail and open a new um, 311 non-emergency line um, for the public. So it was really fantastic to have these three folks come together to experience the film together and then react. And one of the things we had great interaction with the audience, but one of the things that I really was excited to see was the conversation among the three panelists after we turned the cameras off. Um, 
to the audience and the three of them continued the conversation and Chief Deckmar asking questions about the Atlanta Policing Diversion Initiative, wanting to meet with the district attorney from Athens. So the collaboration or the potential for collaboration that was kind of planted through that was really just fabulous. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking of um, when Latanya was talking about civic engagement and, and you know, learning about what, what is possible for a citizen and how to be involved, one thing that really surprised me is that during our screening event, I conducted, I did, a, we used the OV platform, thank you, ITVS and CPB for that. And through the polling tool, um, it was shocking to me how the majority of the audience who opted in to attend a screening of this film um, did not know who their own uh, local district attorney was. And so um, it was an opportunity to, uh, to just bring light on, you know, everyone can play a role. Um, and everyone has a role and just another layer of civic engagement and how important that is. And, um, you know, on the local level, in addition to, you know, national elections. So it was really a fantastic opportunity. And, um, and we, we screened, uh, this was prior to the uh, first episode, the broadcast of the first episode. So we were able to um, archive the recording of that panel discussion and then continue to make that available for people as the series continued um, airing throughout the spring. So uh, it was a great opportunity. Um, Emily, thank you so much for that. And it, it really strikes me, I'm hearing you know, from both you and Travis about the power of this public platform. We know that public television, our mission really is to empower the people. Interestingly enough, you know, the role of the prosecutor's office is really supposed to be to protect the safety of the public. And I really wanna, you know, talk a little bit about equity here, you know, because what you're talking about is making the connections that actually can make the change. And so, um, and at any time, again, this is a conversation we're gonna be heading in in just a moment to our audience Q&A. Um, so audience, in fact, please do share um, and ask questions or make comments. We'd love to hear from you. But I wanna pivot back to Javi for just a moment, because again, um, thank you, Emily, for paving the way to share about the power of the work that Javi does, the power of the work of impact producers. Impact producers are often, um, you know, sort of like at the end of the line, right? Like after the film has come out and the work is getting done and it's very behind the scenes. But Javi, back to you and that brain trust. Bring us back to where you are now. Who are some of the organizations? What's possible that's brewing out there in terms of organizations and the change that's happening on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll say that I think there's there's often for a lot of filmmakers, as you're getting familiar with what impact is, I think the light bulb first goes on of like, oh, this is a great way to like create conversation around broadcast release or streaming release. Um, as an impact producer, for me, that's the starter pistol. Like that's just the beginning of the work that we're going to do. Um, and I think it was Travis who's, who mentioned that the, these changes don't just happen. Um, it, it's always, there's always a steady drumbeat. Um, and so to that end, you know, once the series is out there, okay, great. Now, how can we continue to get as many people as possible to be watching this, to be talking about this? How can we give them the tools that they can continue to think about this, talk about this and, and do something about it after they've finished watching all eight episodes, we hope. Um, but um, so in convening this brain trust, that's what I was thinking, like I was thinking ahead, you know, um, and the brain trust to me is often a really great place to start. It's a great place to engage people. Um, there's almost never enough time to have all the conversations that you want to have. Um, and so it really sets the stage for follow up with all of these partners. So, um, you know, since that we had held our brain trust in February, and since then I've continued to talk to partners about um, collaborations, events. Um, we had a couple of uh, Facebook live events around the premiere 
um, with our partners at Vera Institute of Justice um, and at Fair and Just Prosecution. But we're continuing to talk to folks. Um, we're actually in the middle of putting together an, a forthcoming event with Fair and Just Con um, Prosecution in conversation with the Bail Project. Um, and I think that will be another great example of convening folks um, who might not necessarily always be in the same room having these conversations um, in a meaningful way. And we're looking forward um, to the fall. You know, I think the unique thing about working on a series, um, and I've worked on, on feature docs mostly before, but this is the first time that I've had the chance to work on a series like this. And what's cool about that is you can have conversation series. So, so much like um, the series that you all put together um, with MPT um, around HBCUs on OV, you can screen multiple episodes, you can have continuing ongoing conversation, which I think just really amplifies the potential for power. So I, that's really been something that I'm taking as a model into the future work that we're doing and seeing how can we you know, use our access to the OV platform, um, use the serial nature of this, uh, of this documentary to engage people in an ongoing way. Um, so we're, you know, trying to connect with all kinds of groups to bring people together to have a few different conversation series coming in the fall. Fantastic. Well, we definitely want to remain in touch. And if there's anything that um, we can drop in the chat around any of that, or we'll make ourselves available so that audience members may be able to follow up with you. Um, you know, to that end, I just want to point out that as we look around this panel, um, what, what's missing um, is that we don't have an intentionally so um, just a criminal justice expert, um, you know, and what it speaks to is not that we're, we don't want to um, diminish the voice of, you know, just and around where the system is at. But the bigger point that we've been experiencing at ITBS through um, the study done by the Center for Media and Social Impact um, on engagement and impact is this idea that um, focus groups are telling us um, that they want to have more conversation after um, watching a film together that actually speaks to what is going on in their communities. Um, people are, are interested in hearing what experts have to say, but that many of the solutions actually exist in the community and in people who have actually been impacted by the system. And I do wanna open up um, this conversation because we started by saying Larry's vision once he got elected was to sort of transform this mass incarceration system. And what we're learning through public media and our experience on the ground is that that can happen, but it will happen in communities, not necessarily only through policy. So I wanna open that up because what I hear in that is a word that Travis brought into this conversation earlier, and that is humanity. The humanizing of what this whole uh, quote unquote criminal justice system does um, to people and families and without saying wrong or right, but the reality that it's communities that are going to be part of the solution. So let me just open it up and ask, um, you know, is this the 21st um, century meaning for public media or, you know, what is, what is, what role can we all play? Javi says we're, you know, it's communities, it's people. What, are, what other ingredients do we need to realize an effective change? Well, Travis? I, I just want to jump in real briefly. If you think about right now, the steady diet that our viewing public in general feeds on, it's punditry. It's, it's nightly news punditry. It's left of center. It's right of center. It used to be left and right on the same uh, uh, program talking about issues. And it's always the subject matter experts. It's always the people who are steeped in their positions. But what's missing is what do the people say? I, I, I put it this way, when in, in every effort that I try to undertake in public media, I think public media is the place that makes the opinion of the single mother who is speaking truth at her kitchen table just as potent, just as powerful, just as important as what that pundit says on TV. These are the people who live in the community, work in the community, are dealing with the community issues. We have the ability and the opportunity to have their voices come forward as the solutions and the problems 
that are in their own community. That's where the equity comes in because it empowers those who have not had a platform to influence change. That to me is what public media should be all about. I think that is the moment that we're in and it is the opportunity that we have to be of greater value and service to the communities which we are privileged to be stewards over the airwaves um, that, that they're able to receive content. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, and it's a perfect moment to really thank um, PBS actually for, um, from our standpoint, as we look, you know, at ITBS at bringing forward more content, which we are certainly inspired to do. Philly DA has only affirmed our commitment ongoingly to store what we call stories for justice. And um, to that end, I do wanna share as well and thank PBS for partnering with us in this stories for justice work, which is really, um, it's a five-year multi-platform partnership combining 20 plus, and I'm sure there will be plus, documentary um, features, films, shorts, um, local journalism partnerships as well with stations, um, content that will be bought forth over a five year period to really help move the needle on ending mass incarceration, but really on justice in America. Um, we've actually been dealing with a climate that is unpredictable, but one thing that we can predict is that the needle will not move unless we actually engage communities across the country. Um, as Emily pointed out, um, just in one screening of one event alone, so few people who came interested in this work did not know who their DAs were. So I would say that this, the goal of even having people understand the role of the prosecutor's office is, um, is being realized by Philly DA and the work that we're doing out in the field. So a big thanks to, um, to all of our stations, to PBS for seeing um, the vision for and the need for stories for justice to continue um, and for us to continue to green light um, films that and projects along the, you know, just basically along the spectrum that will impact the ability for public, the public to engage in these conversations. So with that, I want to turn to our audience and just see if we have any questions. Um, but while we do that, I want to go back to Latanya for a moment. Latanya, we didn't get to hear from you on the big question of really going back to our original question today, the power of storytelling. Your story is making a difference. I had the opportunity to watch an event that I believe you were the central figure of in South Philly, which I loved. It was I couldn't stop watching. And um, part of that storytelling, may, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Above All Odds and um, anything else that you'd like us to know about the power of story. I just want to say thank you so much, Sherry, and all these esteemed panelists that's really pushing forth the narrative that need to be heard for the change that we want in our nation. Right. And when we like when the episode for um, and my family haven't had watched it and, you know, and they asked me, like, how can or would you like to, you know, show this screen? And I said, I want to show it to my community. I want it to be in a heart. So actually it was in West Philadelphia at One Art Studios, which is on Muhammad Ali's way. Right. And like, I just remember stories of, you know, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, just coming and bringing this community, you know, Black power, you know, self-determination, determination and civic engagement uh, to the community. So I really wanted to be there. And I didn't want it to just be a showing where it was like, oh, this is Latinian story. I really wanted to replicate the stories that's continuing today. And while the system is slow turning, how can we invoke um, the compassion, and the energy that I knew that was going to come out of this episode, but how can we push that into power, right? And, you know, Ted, Yoni, and Nicole, especially, you know, they was all for it. And they said, invite who you want. So we had local individuals that never sat across from state representatives nor district attorneys. And it wasn't just my story. After that conversation, it evoked into the story of the community in a way that the community was asking them to address um, some of the issues that wasn't, um, that we just can't address through policy. That has to be done due the unconstitutional laws that set, right? And um, the, 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 like, the ripple effect of what slavery started at the beginning. So this conversation, like, 
kind of fuse the fact that, you know, okay, policies are good, but what can we do as civil individuals to change the laws that are currently oppressing us? And it was, you know, array of community individuals that was still currently on probation. One individual, we had to actually pay their probation officer to be a part of the panel because he was on house arrest for a charge that in Pennsylvania, they say that they would no longer arrest people for cannabis possession, but because the consumption of it and he couldn't afford to pay for medical use, he was now on house arrest, right? And literally hours before the event, I'm sitting there talking to this individual's parole officer and asking him to let him be a part of this situation. And his probation officer stole so stuck, and I, w- I want to quote James Baldwin, and on the debate that he had at Cambridge University, is the American Negro, is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro? And he said, if he goes to that event, and if you're going to pay him for that event, then he has to put, would you pay him for that event to be on his panel, or to, just to be involved, he has to pay that back in fines. And I found that as a hindrance to his civic engagement and, um, you know, just being able to connect him with individuals that understood or could actually drive a force of change. Um, but like above all odds, that's, that's our mission as an organization, as a formerly impacted founder of an organization that really understands what's the needs and how to address them, not only in policies, but legislation. Right. And how can we lobby the legislation that reflects our community needs? That's above all our purpose. And I just, you know, really appreciate that because, you know, he wasn't violated, you know, and his probation officer was shunned. If like, He felt bad for even putting them stipulations on him that as a civilian, he deserves to be able to be civilly engaged. So just in order to highlight that in ways um, that's important to us as a community, the stand in solidarity of uh, broadcasting agencies that's also willing to amplify these voices and concerns. Um, I, I remember growing up on Eyes on a Prize, right? But Eyes on a Prize, I just was sat there with such emotion, but I didn't know what to do with it. But I think that uh, Philly DA and these series of showings is actually helping us, uh, you know, not only gear our emotion, but directed it into action. Well, LaTanya, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to really close it there. I think it could be said any more powerfully. Um, I do want to say that in the chat, we had several that fit in the same vein around what's changing as a result of Philly DA. I think you've answered that question as well as this huge dimensions of this impact campaign that continue. And we just cannot thank you all enough for this moment in time, looking forward and to be continued. Um, I think we are now going to turn it back to Ken, but I can't thank you enough. And thank you to AFI for having us. Thank you to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you, PBS. Thank you to all the audience members who have watched Philly DA and to all those who will. Thanks very much. Over to you, Ken. Thanks, Sherry. And thanks to, to our panel. Um, Latanya, you really ended it on a, on a really powerful note. Thank you for that. Um, and Sherry, thank you and, and your colleagues, Michael and Royd, for making this two-part panel a reality. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to also, again, reiterate that the series is available for anyone to watch uh, on streaming through the PBS video app and pbs.org. Um, and also let our audience know that um, while this is marks the end of the industry forum, we do have our free docs talk tomorrow, History is Out of the Closet, Excavating Queer Stories, which happens tomorrow, Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Please do join us for that. And as always, we'd love to hear from you on social media at hashtag AFI docs. And please do check out our lineup at docs.afi.com. Thanks, everyone.